Welcome to the lore you know. Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome back to Sarah. It's good to see you. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. It's Hooray. great to be back. Yay. I am not 100% recovered from my surgery, but I am like most of the way there. Yay. And I am no longer on the uh, narcotics. <laughs> Always the bonus. Which I, was on, which I was not on very long, which I was not on very long. Nice. But uh, uh, yeah, so I'm doing way better and able to sit back at my desk which i haven't been able to do for a little while and uh yeah so doing good Huzzah. it's fun it's fun having surgery during covid i can imagine <laughs> yeah and i got to have a I'm... covid test before it nice i'm, I'm glad everything <laughs> as far as you know everything went well right <laughs> yes everything went well um all of the everything's yeah yeah regarding surgery so um, yeah i've i'm not I've read yeah. horror stories, and so I was just like, I'm not going to talk about this until after you're done, and now you're done, and so now we can be like, it's there okay. were horror stories that you didn't have Fair. to live through, so who, who Yeah, really? no, no, it wasn't bad at all. Welcome back. I did spend a night in the hospital, that was about the only, yeah. no, which was trippy, which was all trippy. Yeah, it is a weird experience <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to have to slouch a little bit, because, ow. Okay, but... <laughs> So yeah, we're because I'm talking about we're um, shifting gears back to Scarlands because last week I did some uh, Asunder stuff, but this week we're also shifting gears to a new continent that Finally. is available on the Cerisian Vault. Now it's not; it wasn't set; it wasn't released as um, on Express, but it was released on the Cerisian Vault so that you, as designers or want to be designers, can go on to the community content program and build up this this awesome setting which is called Fenrelic. And so if this you... is this is as official as things get on yeah. the Sloracian Vault. <laughs> right. So and given that it ties into some other official stuff, I'm I'm calling it near canon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. I, I like canon adjacent. I would say that uh everything <laughs> is really um Oh, hi to all of the viewers. I see Alain is on here, and I don't know who Inclusive Gaming is, but hello, Alain? Inclusive Gaming. Alain. Alain. Um, That's Brent says it's Alain. I trust your French pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> I trust, so, obviously, Alain's more. Right. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, it's, he says it's good. <laughs> it's good. So, yeah, the... Right. Uh, the, Three years of high school French. I'm not good. <laughs> right. Fenric first showed up in the Strange Lands third edition book, which was um, pr published by Swords and Sorcery, and it had like it was like a third of the book. It, it was like all of these continents that they had in pl uh, like they were really aiming for. There it is, and then they were like less than third of the book. Yeah, we're running out of third edition. We're going to smoosh everything into this book. I feel like that's what happened. Yeah. This and was the last book, and right. basically they were, I think they were working on three books, and then it was like, we are closing the studio, um, <laughs> or something, and they just rushed, A, they rushed it out, because it's really evident if you yeah. actually pick this up, that it was a rush job, because yeah. there's a lot of editorial errors, um, but uh, including lacks, lack of a scale on one of the maps. Right? <laughs> um, How not big on the is this map. continent? Who knows? Uh, oh, actually, actually, a lack of scale on the cross map. I don't and know, inclusive but... gaming is Josh Heath. He worked on Dead Man's Rust with you. So... I didn't work on Dead Man's Rust. Oh, Fran worked on sorry. Dead Man's Rust. Well, okay. I, you I worked... being you and Fran. <laughs> I worked. I did like. <laughs> He's much on Dead Man's Rust. Nice, nice. Basically, I was a sounding board for Fran. Yeah. Um, but I was I had day job and and couldn't make the commitment at the time. I know because... you were two separate people, but I I put you together so. <laughs> No, you should, because honestly, like, everything on the wiki, while Fran does all the typing, it's all because I'm like, oh, put this in there, by the way, dear. <laughs> and, like... Speaking of Fran, she's joined us. Welcome. Awesome. Oh, she was napping, like, five yeah. minutes ago. She awesome. says she's okay. awake. What'd she miss? You haven't missed anything yet. We're just delving anything. in, so... I'm just talking about my surgery. Okay. Yeah, but... Oh, yeah, so the old map of Frost of Fenrick did not have a scale. And that was part of the mystery. Yeah. And so that so has we been had rectified. to figure out how big it was. <laughs> yeah. And and it was actually, I think, a French map that helped in that determination. Because um, somebody had put out this uh, this global map that admittedly has the whole the blood sea's too big problem um, that I that I stared at for many many times, many yeah. hours, going, how do I resolve this? Because 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 as a GM, I'm a I try. 
I try to put science around my fantasy, like a fool. Right. And and I wanted to like give give the planet time zones and shit. Like if you're teleporting from Gelsbad to to Termana, right? What time is it going to be when you arrive? You know, because it's presumably teleportation is yeah. relatively instant. But um, so if it was morning in Gelsbad, is it afternoon in Termana? You know. Um, and so I was sitting there trying to figure out. It's like okay, we've established that it's 24 hours and. Uh, a day because we're not messing with that rule even though we've messed with lengths of weeks and months and all that so how big is the planet and thus was in the end how big is the blood sea and how big is fenrir like right <laughs> and and this one map did a decent job of answering that and made fenrir like um about the size of a little bit smaller than Gelsbad. like just a wee bit smaller than Gelsbad, which i thought was like still flipping huge it is huge but yeah. But Gelsbad is not that big. Um, Gelsbad's smaller than North America. Gelsbad's only about the size of the continental U.S., plus maybe a little bit. Yeah. Um, compared to Termana, which is like smush Africa and Asia together. It's fucking huge. Yeah, that's it's enormous. Like six times the size of Gelsbad. But uh, at least Gelsbad and Asherak um, and uh, the Dragonlands, which we talked about last spring i don't know when we talked about it right now. <laughs> um are all about the same size so fenrilic was kind of shoved in there about the same size. um which makes it very very large compared i know i said i just said it wasn't large but think about it fenrilic is basically uh alaska slash siberia slash norway and, and any of your other favorite northern climbs of the of the earth and it's pretty big. Yeah. Makes it interesting. And again, Alaska's. So Alan just posted that map that you were talking about, and so I brought it up so everyone can kind of see. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Here, interesting map. Yeah, you and I'm not saying this so map is canon. This is the uh, but... this is the like the area you can actually publish for. Were you up until now the only place you could actually publish for in the community content program? Way over here is Fenrir Lake, and it is like. You know, I always re like relate it to the Antarctic in the Arctic's place because it is way more Antarctic feeling as far as glaciers and like the life that's on it or pretty much lack thereof. You know, it's like a, it's a it's not like going to Alaska. It's not like going to, you know, like there are certain areas. I, but it's that got are. Alaska vibes because there are areas where there's foliage right. and there's virtually no foliage in Antarctica short of right. lichen. Yeah, I I did the research. <laughs> oh it's my true. god, I did the research. Right. Um, and I know when I was in my writing, while I did a lot of Alaska or Antarctica vibe, I also did some Alaska vibe. But I've never been to either place, so it was based on, on on stuff. And I actually talk about. I've, I wrote a couple of blog posts up on the OP website about how this writing went, and I watched <laughs> documentaries. <laughs> Alaska and Antarctica and I didn't I sh and I did some research on Norway so those were kind of the three I'd say those are the three regions that had the biggest influence yeah. um, in terms of real world regions I did no research on um, uh, the uh, Faerun Rhyme of the Frost Maiden none at all yeah <laughs> which is good so because there was I don't no feel like influence it, from yeah, that and I don't feel it really fits <laughs> that area either it's not yeah like right now during Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, I feel like that area is much more like Frostlands of Fenrilic is, but um, typically without <laughs> Arl like making everything a constant winter, uh, Fenrilic is just a frozen place. Like it is not. Um, I don't feel like summer there is very summery. <laughs> oh, your it's audio. It's different though. There we go. Oh, it's it's different though. I mean, one of the things I talked about is the fact that they have, um, have weeks of of no sunrise, sunset, right. and then in the winter times, weeks of no sunrise. So, which is true for places like uh, Norway and Alaska, and yeah. parts of Alaska. Um, so I I kind of and and Antarctica, obviously. So kind of thought about it like, what is that zone? And even even things like um, the Northern Lights, which are just very vaguely described in the book right um and looking at i did research on that and looking at where the northern light band takes place if you're in fenrilic you're actually looking south to see them 
so they're on like the southern horizon which yeah. is I think, yet in those places they're kind of either on the northern horizon or overhead or whatever um depending on where you are um so i think that that was that was kind of my tip of like where is it exactly and i didn't we never specified that it was the north pole mm -hmm. um but it's certainly really close to the north yeah yeah in the original book it's <laughs> it's described as northwest from Gelsbad by quite yeah. a ways it's not it's like by, and it's at a longer journey than the journey to Termana, but is that because it's a longer distance or because it's harder to reach? Right. Yeah. Kept Are there like vague. ice flows that make your ship not be able to just like go through it? And yeah, it's yeah. a really good question. Yeah. So I, we kept it vague. Um, nice. And also, I, I've I've used magic as a reason to get to Termana faster. Like you can use gust of wind magic right? to make your boat sail way faster and yeah. you know and, and then you would in a normal you know typical era sailing ship and then Fenrilic it's like well gust of wind isn't going to help you if you're having to do ice breaking <laughs> the entire way yeah so um the stiffened sea is aptly named just the first line of the book I like uh, our... Alon says that you can make a pact with Queen Ran she might have enough sway i would say she is one of the few creatures in the blood sea that has that kind of sway as opposed oh, to yeah. uh you know there i don't know if kadoom would really you know be like hey I'm, I'm laying down here on the bottom bleeding i'll i'll just wave my arm and let you go faster now not so much i was i was chalk it up to like just sea witches being able to be like the wind does not die because i make sure and, um and they just i mean gust of wind is almost the last rounds but yeah. Magic. I would have did it. The other thing with magic is like, yes, this is what players have access to, but there are always other spells and there's always specific yeah. stuff that's never going to make sense for your character unless you happen to be a sailor or something like that. So exactly. I always DM with magic that people don't have access to because it's yeah. very specific. And so um, sailor wizards or or sorcerers or whatever probably have spells or objects that they create that create an ongoing gust of wind or you get sea witches to do it or you know it's whatever you need to make it happen that's what happened <laughs> and then that applies to Fenrir like because it's really cold yeah like 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 so so in the book you know we can get into some details of the book there's um, we, I, I wrote a wrapper around the whole thing of this um, elf anthropo anthropologist. Not, not that it's apparent, but um, that she's an anthropologist, but she is, um, who's, a, who's from Galsbad, um, and she goes to this kind of this expedition um, to find out about Fenrilic on behalf of the Vivesian Vigil and, and the Library of Leone and, you know, various people of interest in Gelsbad. And to and that's kind of the wrapper around the first three chapters of the book is is from this perfect pers to give an outside perspective of okay okay you know about Gelsbad, here's what a Gelsbad person who's pretty educated thinks about Fenrilic as she discovers everything. So it was, it was just a, and so typical of these the classic Scarlands books they always have or just about all of the campaign setting books have some kind of wrapper thing of a journal or right a, a report to you know. Calamus Dern, did you know that blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Yugman will have a thing, you know. Right. So all these NPCs. So I was just like, I don't want to use a Skywarder or, or a Yugman, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invent a new character. So I introduced Yenny Kaneru, um, who's my elvish wizard uh, <laughs> my, who, who does this journey. Yeah. Um, and, and she travels with a, a Manticora, named Luazi, and they meet up with a, a guide, a Slytherin guide named Pizzo, and the three of them travel across the continent together. Yeah. Um, a lot and, of description, yeah. And that brings up a good but, point. So yeah. there aren't really elves, there aren't Manticora oh, on this continent, um, but there or, are Slytherin. Or Slytherin, yes. Yes, <laughs> how the hell did they get there? Um, I ha uh, there, so here's this. Um, I'm working on another book to go with this that I'm hoping to get out the next two weeks. We're gonna we're gonna be optimistic and say the next two weeks. Um, 
first of all, which is which expands Yenny's journal. So Yenny's journal in Frostlands of Fenrilic is is fairly short. It's got like introductory to the first three chapters right. and little, some little inserts here and there. I've I've about maybe tripled the size of it in this new book. And the book is probably going to be called just Yenny's journal. It's got um, more of that and includes also a map of Kobo Kimura, the city, which we didn't have time to get into the book. We were like working on it very, very at the end and it just, there wasn't enough time to get it because we had to go print on demand and there was a whole deadlines. giant <laughs> yeah, and, and deadlines and there was and well, we hadn't necessarily planned on that map either, um, so it was sort of like, let's do it and Fran was like, I'm going to do it. Yeah. So I, I drew, I probably still have it around here somewhere, I drew yeah. here it is Here's the early map of Kobu Kimru. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Graph paper for the win. <laughs> that, um, I think that's north. Yeah, that's north. That uh, that we converted to like not graph paper with right. pen scratchings. Um, and um, and Fran redid this beautifully. Um, and that's going to go in Yenny's journal as well as as uh, their characters and some new spells and a new ritual. So, um, and some some stuff around that so kind of cool uh but anyway my point is that also describes how the slytherin got there nice <laughs> look i threw in a lampshade of how did the slytherin get to fenrir yeah well they were looking for a place to live that didn't have god followers there trying to kill them yeah which is <laughs> so that that's a good segue so there aren't it's like one of the um weird things from going from gal's bad in this mind space that like the 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 majority of the populace, at least the majority of civilization, are god worshippers, um, because uh, the yeah, divine yeah. war happened. The titans got their butts kicked. All the titans are, I mean, they can't die, but they're defeated and you know imprisoned or whatever. With, with the introduction of the redeemed, that adds that race. Right. So suddenly, races that were just titans, like the Asathi and the Slytherin, there's right. god worshippers among them too. Yeah. So. But the Divine War, while it was kind of known about in Fenrir, like it wasn't really like a thing there. And the gods aren't, I don't want to say not worship, but it's not like a thing that they were like, hey, I'm going to go worship Corian today because... Yeah, and the, the history of, of Skarn, and we haven't, we haven't touched Asherak yet, so at some point we're going to... Have we touched Asherak? I don't think we've talked about Asherak yet. We've mentioned we've it a little bit, yeah. a bit. We've mentioned it, but we haven't covered the continent. Um, is that gods were basically religion of the gods, of the clerics and whatnot, were started in Asherak. And effectively, missionaries from Asherak, or people from Asherak who ended up being missionaries, you know, traveled across the rest of the planet. And with the exception of the elves, because the elf god started in... Um, in Termana, right. or or the lost island of Atlantis that sunk between Termana and Gelsped. It's not called Atlantis, I don't know what it's called. But... <laughs> when did when we eventually get to the history of the elves, we'll talk right. about that shit. But but other than other than him, all of the gods pretty much except for a bunch of demigods, pretty much started in, in Ashrak. And then people went and brought god religion to these other places. And so I think what the deal was Fenrilic is nobody there weren't any God worshipping missionaries that came to Fenrir. So actually claim in, in digging through that lore and again a's expansion of the lore is discovering that humans reached Fenrir like before the gods were discovered. Not necessarily before they were born. Maybe before they were born. Certainly before they started being worshipped by um, by people. So literally it's just not a significant number of missionaries made it there. The only trade they have with any of any level is with the Albadians who are pretty tight and groovy as a rule they worship the three um the three mothers which is belsmith madriel and denev but that's mostly because like they wanted to be on the winning side in the war um, <laughs> but they're but they're really groovy with denev and they follow denev as well as other titans in, in fenrilic so it's like just not so it's not to say the folks in fenrilic haven't heard of the gods right but they just it never took off right so if you're playing in Fenrilic and if you're a god worshiper or cleric, you are not only a minority, you are probably unique. Yeah. And people are like, <laughs> wait, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So. But what's I interesting is that, yeah. like, a lot of the peoples of Fenrilic share a 
belief system. I, I, I have a hard time calling it Ushada worship worship. There's three. There's kind of three primary belief systems in general, like, yeah. but they're overlapping significantly. Yeah, and they um, but they they share Ushada following worship kind of uh, worship, yeah. uh, reverence. I feel mm-hmm. like Ushada is more like reverence of spirits rather than like yeah. And and Termana has that. And so, like, Come you on. have this, like, gap in between that scales bad. But, like, yeah. It, How it's did on... that happen? And so there's this implication of a connection between... And there's a lot of that because we talk about... Um, there's three new races um, in Frostlands. Two, one was introduced in um, Strange Tribes, which is the Eshik, or the, or the Winter Gnomes. Um, and they're very similar to the Gnomes of Termana. Um, I always used to always say this phrase was, there are no gnomes in Skarn. <laughs> um, you cannot play, I never let people, I want to play a gnome in, no, you can't play a gnome illusionist in Skarlands. My No, they don't exist. And then it's like, oh crap, there's gnomes in Termana. Okay, there's some gnomes, but they're funky. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's like a weird gnome. <laughs> there's that one guy in Shelzar who does tattoos, you know. Um, so the no. so the, Strange tribes made some implications vaguely that maybe the gnomes of Termana were somehow related to the gnomes of Frostman. I think it, it more or less said they looked like them, they but they're fae. Like they're not gnomes at all. They just yeah. happen to look like them. And so, yeah, my thought ignorant is humans <laughs> are like certain winter gnomes. Titan, you know, my, my headcanon, yeah. which we did not, we, this is totally headcanon on my part. We did not make this clear. We did not cement this in the book so do what you want whatever it is that a certain titan associated with ice <laughs> went to termana and saw, or happened to be in termana saw these cool little gnomes and went oh i want something like that and in and uh, in her where she hung out most of the time which was fenrilic went i'm gonna make some and just dug into the ice and made little gnome people yeah and, yeah, and their just, their oral <laughs> history goes back and says they sprang from yeah. the ice so, and I, I, I am a hundred percent convinced that they were made by Gulaben, um, because it just makes sense. <laughs> but, but we do not explicitly say that, and um, because a Gulaben is lost, um, but b, um, it doesn't have to be that, you know. It could have been Lething, could have been Denev, it could have been a Demi thing, it could have been a who knows what, anything you wanted. Right. So. So we, we kept it vague on purpose so that the, the GMs can kind of decide that if, as, as what fits their campaign. And I like that idea. I like that, it, like leaving it a mystery, but leaving it, you know, because yeah, there's also some implication that a couple of the Titans are buried there based on where the Titans are buried description. Gulaben, they said Gulaben was, was, was put in four cages and put in the four corners of Skarn. Skarn's spherical. Yeah, silly corners. Uh, where's what's a corner? And I was like, well, North Pole, <laughs> pretty good corner. Yeah, um, maybe she was put there. And then, um, Gol, I want to get the right one. Golthaga, there we go. Golthaga was cut in twain. Thank you, Vangle. One half was put on the North Pole, and one half was put on the South Pole. But they, or actually, don't say the North Pole and the South Pole. They say opposite ends of the earth, of opposite ends of Skarn. And there's a convenient giant fissure gorge in Fenrilic at the north and in Tanaroth at the south. You could have put it half a titan in. <laughs> right. Just, like, just throw Gor- Golthaga in Tobor Gorge and throw the other half of Golthaga in, um, in the big fissure in, uh, in uh, the Dragonlands. So I'm thinking there's at least two titans buried. <laughs> So there is that as well, and and, you, and there's some fun things there. So and I hint at that in the book without explicitly saying it. You can, if you read it, you can find those hints. <laughs> but uh, like, hmm, what's that thing in Torbor Gorge? It's weird. Yeah. So yeah. Um. Anyway, but but again, we didn't. We weren't explicit about it because honestly, we just didn't want to be like to say this is canon. To say yes, part of Gulliven is is there. Um, in, in, in any more than we say where Gormoth is or where, I mean, Cadom is the only one who, well, Cadom and Churn are the only ones we, this is where they are. <laughs> um, I think those are the only Titans where it's really clear where you can find them. Um, so, 
Um, and that's, and that's again, intentional because we don't want to get too specific because these are more like seeds you can put in your campaign rather right. than explicit meta plot stuff you want to do. Yeah. Anyway. I've gone all over the weeds. <laughs> so we talked about the, the Eshek who are essentially these ice fae. That was Elian. That um, was all you. They're probably one of the um, most prolific as far as... Uh, having the most villages around. And then there are humans. Uh, there are dwarves. And then we introduce a couple of other races in the uh, the book for you to play. The, the um, new book. Yeah, the new book, yeah. The Frost Lines of Fenderlick. So these, so, these so two viewers, didn't... Jeremy wrote the Eshik. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and one of the new races. Yeah. So just, I'm going to put that there. I did not write the racial descriptions beyond the village. that I did, I did describe a village, but that was it. So, yes, tell us about the new races. Well, so at the behest of Travis, uh, Travis, like, who's the line developer, um, oh, thanks, Fran. Um, Travis wanted uh, the Ice Wardens to become a playable race, and the Ice Wardens are these um, icy oozes <laughs> that exist only on Fenrir Lake, and uh, they essentially imprint on a humanoid and create a copy of them that has all of their... Uh, abilities and memories and so how to make them into a playable race and so we came up with the uh the taslin which are the imprints of these people that are still alive somewhere but something has happened and this goes back to um like my name I they was... have a silent h at the end it's true um this i leaned into sarah's theory or headcanon or whatever you want to call it that there was a titan buried or thrown into one of these um, chasms and so without stating so essentially like because the, the Taslin have just recently shown up like within the last 150 years and what happened during that time some titan's corpse got thrown down there perhaps that's the event that caused the Taslin to separate from their their original ooze um, and so Figure now, it was Golthaga or Gulaban? <laughs> I think I was going Golthaga. I, Golthaga, yeah, in maps. I, I think that's where I was going, yeah. But again, yeah. because we didn't want to, like, say, and say, we wanted yeah. to leave it open for your campaign to, you know, do with it what you will, that doesn't need to be where they came from. And you can do what you want to with them. But yeah, they are ice people that are, they retain, because of the separation from their ooze, they retain, like, hazy memory from their previous lives and so that's how you start back at level how you can start at level one <laughs> i think of it as sort of like take an uh, an eshek and merge it with a hollow legionnaire yeah <laughs> i i felt like, that too <laughs> like like okay they've got the eshek like cold is fine qualities but they've got the hollow legionnaire i have a past life <laughs> right? qualities right so. absolutely but with and with some unique with some neat unique stuff too that's, yeah little L. and then uh conry conry uh, conry was... did the cramp well conry did the bulk of the cramp pack, but i will also say the cramp pack was a was a um a group effort yeah <laughs> there was like six people involved in making these things and so the cramp pack are a race of <laughs> creatures that just recently they've existed for a long time but they've been um subterranean up until now and it's not until there here's a little bit of spoiler at the during the adventure that is in Frostlands of Fenrir Lake, um, the adventurers find the Krampic for the first time, and so the Krampic are these adorable, <laughs> furry, horned creatures. That... The, the Krampic was were interesting because yeah. um, I hope I hope Travis is okay with me talking about this, but Travis originally had this idea of sort of this, uh, this sort of uh, take like the alien greys oh they were absolutely gray aliens <laughs> yeah gray aliens. but but it gave them an andorian antenna right um like kind of like like the tick in the tick tv show his antenna moves with his emotions um and and then added some other features like you know this climbing ability and stuff and we started to run with it but then i i want to say it was a lee who said let's give them let's paint them with like glow in the dark um, algae, 
and because there we were throwing algae in it because she was working on the adventure i was working on the village description so her and i got together to talk about like how we tied the village description with the adventure so they were consistent and then conry comes in and starts talking about like their ideas for for the and the three of us are kind of hashing it out and then right. we've got travis's input and we've got the artist's input and we and you know fran of course is in my ear so uh, like between the lot of us we're trying to do this and then we sort of went they have fur because at one point i said give them fraggle tails right <laughs> and it was like because <laughs> that would be cool because because as i'm describing the village i'm realizing i'm describing fraggle rock um <laughs> And if you're too young to know what Frag Fraggle Rock is, I'm pretty sure it's on Blu-ray or something. Go buy yeah. it. Go watch it. Fraggle you will Rock be Rock. forever changed. <laughs> yeah, so really like I'm describing Fraggle Rock because I started describing like, okay, there's some of them that go out adventuring and like see the world and stuff, and they think they call it the edge of the world, the edge of the universe. And I was like, that's what the Fraggles call the rest of the world is the edge of the universe, and that's where they meet humans and stuff. And, yeah. And there's traveling that. So I was like. Is there like a traveling Matt cram pack? And there isn't a traveling necessarily a traveling Matt cram pack, but there's a gobo. <laughs> yeah. There's his nephew, who's who's like like that. And and we've got so we've got those kind of vibes. So there's a little bit of fraggleness, and there's a little bit of alien greys, and there's a little bit of just cute furries. And because Cartlands didn't have enough furries, <laughs> right? But and they're they're. Adorable but mean because they're, they're also halfling sized, but they're they're they you know they've got the badass claw claw bite thing going, but they've also got like they're just this discerningly cute, disarmingly cute, armingly cute because you're like, oh, it's so cute, it's so oh, it's biting ah, my face, off. right? <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, for the Krampek, part of the reason they haven't been seen on the surface are the Skarai, and so the Skarai are these horrid scorpion people um that there was a part of me that was like i really want these to be player races but you gotta have bad guys and so the scry are the uh the epitome of bad guys on fenrelic and they also are are subterranean um a lot because they so in the original book it talks about how more than likely they're tied to the um Oh, I forgot what they're the, called. The sands. Sandtaskers. Sandtaskers. Yeah, they're like and that. I think I believe they are in the, the new creature collection. And they're um, from then, from Asherak. Asherak. Yeah. Yeah, and the the old original book had sand this whole something thing. Like that. Sand maskers. Yeah, yeah. The original. I'll just open up the original book and dig it up. It's pretty. And there's obviously really like a fun. a visual similarity between them like scorpion oh, yeah, yeah. bodies with the humanoid body coming out of it but if you look at the scorpion sand masker actually i should find a sand masker um yeah they're they're way more human looking on like they have like skin and you know they have like human heads and everything and they were created by an, an evil fellow near the end of a war as essentially his last curse upon those who were defeating him and as he and like he was like uttered... this uber wizard basically right. this arch mage thing right um and and he made the the scarai and then like 20 years later the or he made the sorry he made the uh the sand taskers and then 20 years later the scarai showed up in front of him right like thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away yeah. and what the hell yeah and so there's this mystery of you know of this this connection to the war like and it happened like during the war not the end it, it was i believe it was during the war i'd have to double check that but and then this this new race shows up in front of them. but also they have the original art has this their faces are not humanoid looking, right even though they have they have they have upper torso pretty much waist to neck looks humanish yeah. Humanoid Although they have like you know like these plates like these kind of chitinous yeah, growths they're, and they're stuff and and the description weird. in the new book does reflect that. Although the art, not so much. Uh, the art yeah, is a little superheroish looking, which there's nothing oh, wrong with. Oh, because of the muscles. 
The muscles I'm... and the armbands, I think. Yeah. But yeah. But there's 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 the guy in the original book's pretty muscly armbands. Right? The only thing they really changed was the nipple piercings, I think. <laughs> yeah. But they should <laughs> and be. And honestly, they I, be a I wasn't more a fan. And, and, and Unless they're such. coming out from. Oh wait a minute. They may be coming out from his hair. They might be little rings at the bottom of his hair. It's really hard to tell in the original art where those no, they're, rings they're are they're probably attached. nipples. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're in the original uh, uh i'm looking like guy out there but in the i got two pictures behind me um in the new art yeah they, they, they just kind of gave them simple armor um but they still get the long hair the long true but, but and, they've got their, and their, their faces, faces are a little non-humanish the, they have multiple yeah, eyes and multiple eyes yeah. like a like a spider eye goblin and but then the, the yeah so what's the connection between the two and we kept that vague. I have again my head cannon. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, how did humans get to Fenrilic? Is how long have humans been in Fenrilic? So in the book, in the new book, we, we, we state that humans came to Fenrilic hundreds of years ago, if not thousands of years ago, pre learned about the gods. And to boot, they didn't come from Asherak, they came from, or they didn't come from Gelsbad, they came from Asherak, which is another thing that it's, it's mentioned. So my thought is, whatever medium the human, because I don't think they went in a boat, <laughs> really don't, given that magic is a thing. Um, I think they had took some kind of gate or teleport thing or something magical sent them there. And could the Skari have used the same device thousands of years later? like activated the ruins of this weird thing and and traveled up that's my theory we didn't make it explicit but we made it implied yeah but you know if you want to be like no they're aliens that came from another planet yeah whatever okay. <laughs> whatever works for okay, your i story. do care a little bit i do care a little bit but yeah um but what made them different um and the fact that it's all subterranean that the Scarai started subterranean and burst out of of uh, uh, what you call it gorge, um, to look gorge. Uh, that's interesting. So they didn't start on the surface, and my 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 instinct always is if it's subterranean and Scarn, Scarn's underdark is basically run by the Slorasians. So did they run into an old Slorasian gate that? turn them into desert dwell from desert dwelling scorpion people to tundra dwelling scorpion people and thus why they look weirdish because could that be a slurasian influence and they somehow get exposed to something slurasian so we left a little mystery there including the idea in the in the new book that the scara are specifically looking for something don't know what underground amongst the under dark of fenrilic and um, using um, uh, various sp species they kidnapped to get it, but they but they're also using various species they kidnapped for other more nefarious things that are really yucky. It's true. It's true. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you wanted to mention this, but go for it. The, the, how they how they how they make their babies? It's really gross. They they like inject people with the stinger tail and that can impregnate them so and then but not like impregnate it's like, like alien it, yeah it's way more like alien <laughs> way more like alien so so which implies Why? that like all the scare are female or yeah something um which is neat i think that's neat um because it makes them even more um even less humanoid mm -hmm. you know, even even more interesting if if they don't have that and if they're not literally mammalian and they're more like more like aliens from alien um that they you know impregnate people and then they baby Scare I burst out like face huggers and <laughs> which and during dinner and of we, all times. And we gave we provided stats for baby Scare in no. this book too. So if you want your scorpion face huggers running around <laughs> chasing your second level party right. <laughs> and killing them all. <laughs> yeah, because the uh, the original Scare I are were like CR seven or something like that. And when yeah. Ailey was writing Adventure, she was like, "I need something that they can actually deal with." And so that thought process really lent itself to let's let's make the the base Scare something uh, will have babies, and then like they have 
just like drow and and goblins and and hobgoblins and and gnolls and you know they have these different um kind of classes uh we decided to build up different skirai that have different powers so like you have their uh a slaver one called the bone breaker and you have like a a, a psionic one um i think they were called mind singers and they you invented uh, them it's true <laughs> it's true although i barely remember anything that happened yesterday let alone what Mind i wrote you, we wrote all right? this in like july <laughs> yeah there was such a lead <laughs> i'm so glad that it came out now when it's getting cold instead of in july so yeah it was like it feels I was, seasonally I was like, fitting yeah we, we started the writing back in like may or june yeah and a lot of this was written in june july and wrapped up in pretty much in august i think was our final deadlines but you'd think I would have had Yanni's journal done by then, but then, you know, surgery happened and... and life gets got in the way. way. Life, life got in the way and I couldn't get any writing done during... But, um, yeah, so the... so when, And because they have all these sonic, psionic abilities, that's that's the obvious tie-in to the to the Slaracians. Right. Because in theory, all psionics and Skarn come from the Slaracians one way or another. Yeah. Um, whether they just, you know, read a book or something, but... but um, got exposed to the language virus. So the fact and it that tracks, the original Scarai right. had psionic powers. Right. And it tracks not. because the Sandmaskers don't, but if they went underground, yeah. found a Saurician ruin, and became infected with their language virus or whatever reason, um, and converted and then went to Fenrir Lake, then now, and in like you said in the third edition books, uh, the, the Scarai have psionics. And so it was a unnatural evolution I think so. I think, I mean, that's that's my reasoning is that some kind of Slaracian gate, that then that happened. Yeah. yeah. And and it makes me think that maybe, um, and we haven't, well, again, didn't write any evidence of this yet, although it could come out in a future Fenrilic book, um, that how humans got to Fenrilic might have been the Slaracians were doing a thing in Fenrilic, a mysterious, mysterious Slaracian thing, because they do that. And they're like, we need slaves. There's no one here but right? penguins. <laughs> um, there's no nothing sentient here. And the Eshik hadn't quite been born yet. And so they went to Asherak and went, oh, grab a bunch of people. And, you know, yeah. And then well, and during the Surgeon Empire, like they had people that were, um, you know, um, pfft, sorry, my brain just turned off. You, they had people that, you know, like a. a what is the word? They were under contract. Tributes. Yeah. So tributes. They, yes, they had people yeah, that yeah. were given to them as tribute because they were. Um, they basically said, we will beat you up unless you give us. It was it was the whole bring a, a maiden to the dragon once a year. Right. <laughs> like, like, we will beat you up unless you give us someone once a year, you know, or whatever the time period was. And so every every country and like Asherak and Gelsbad would be like, here's our tribute, don't beat us up, you know, until the gods and the titans were like, we need to stop that. <laughs> and then beat up the story scenes. But, but, and this was like, this was like ancient times. This yeah. was like pre, pre Mormo epoch kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, and yeah, so it could have been a bunch of people who were tributed and they brought them to Fenrir like, cause they needed people with, Posable thumbs instead right. of, I don't know. Uh, well, and uh, they needed they needed servants and they Alan had humans asked, for that. And, yeah, and Alan, Alan asks whether or not that means that um, you know there there could be fen, uh, humans in Fenrir that have psionic abilities. He says all. I would say most probably don't because most probably were just slaves. But there probably were those that either got infected with the language virus or that were experiments. Um, and so I would say you're just as likely to find a psionic person in Fenrir as you are on Gelsbad. Gelsbad. Right. Yeah. Uh, psionics really, plays, yeah. plays a kind of a large part in Scarred Lands, and it's not really reflected in the 5th edition material yet. Because there's no psionic rules for 5th right. edition that are official. Right. Um, I think the only place you wouldn't find scions in Skarn is the Dragonlands. That makes sense. Yeah. Because they weren't really... Uh, like, it never specifically says that the dragons kept the Slurishians out. They kept the story. But I feel like they did. Yeah. I feel like they did. <laughs> <laughs> I really feel like they did. Um, mm. But I, I think, you know, certainly Galspad, Ashrak, Termana, and, and Fenrir, like, you'd find. So, so, yeah. And 
and kind of there the, the i mean we we threw in a bunch of plot seeds in this new book including like Garar are kidnapping people for a mysterious reason. Right. Not just for, like, making babies or digging mines, but for right. some kind of... They're specifically kidnapping scholars. <laughs> and I was like, let's leave that vague. Right. <laughs> like, what do they need scholars for? Maybe it's to uncover a Slamisian artifact. Or something else, who knows. Right. Uh, maybe they're building some kind of horrible doomsday weapon to kill everybody. So and, it's all there. Play with it. And the new book, uh, Frostlands of Fenrir, it has, besides the Skrai, it has like most of the creatures that were in the, the old book. Yep. It has at least a conversion for everything in there. A lot of them not, um, were not like... white, but almost everything. Well, so Maybe like everything missed, has like, like a... Um, a If you want to use this creature, substitute this creature and put this other stuff on it. So like yeah, Frost Moths, yeah. which is probably one of my favorite pieces of art from the original book because it's pretty horrid and Which i'm one? gonna that open again? it here uh the frost moss is the one with the guy's head sticking out of the oh, frost moss. Yeah. oh yeah that is yeah. that's right up there with with yeah that is one of i hate bugs i mean i really hate bugs and this is like the ultimate and yucky bug yeah black and white art i mean i'm just like oh, i'm glad it's in black and white yeah yeah and it's the guy's, art and essentially that, like, it's a head that's texture. buried in snow and you've got like frost moss climbing out of its mouth and climbing over his head and he's he's obviously dead at least we hope so yeah but they're just like they're pretty much like the blood moths yeah in uh the blood uh so frequent in blood basin um except they're you know icy instead of not yeah and so that's one of them that didn't get like a full conversion so i don't want to say not bloody because they probably are (laughs) and uh I think I'm trying to think of what's some of my favorite creatures. So we'll throw up the oh, crawling oh, glacier. I can name mine by far. It's the gel, gel the gabberlin. Des- no, oh, yeah. I like the gabberlin too. Oh, it's so funny. Here's here's a weird anecdote. So in the middle of writing this, of course, I'm like stressed out my mind, and I actually have this dream. I remember I had this dream that like that like adventurers are fighting this three-headed giant, and and Travis goes, you know, there's a three-headed you mean giant. A gabberlin, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like seriously and i'm like re-looking at the book and i had completely forgotten about them and and yeah there's this uh the gabberlin or a three-headed giant that is basically a trope of see no evil hear no evil speak no evil right because there's it's each of the head has an ability around not having that sense and like then they can do things with it so like the one who who can't hear has anyway three head each through each head it's like it's like an etten with uber powers yeah. basically and, and and they're interesting because they're neutral they're yeah. not evil but they're not good yeah and they're just like this is our thing and don't fuck with it you know and yeah yeah they, so. they're tenders of of the wildlands and so like if you're out yeah. burning down what forests there are or fucking with uh you know the natural order then they might come and smoosh you um but for the and most there's part there's a colony they're... of them a mile away from kova nice <laughs> nice like just that part of the woods just be aware there's three headed giants there and you might not want to go there <laughs> nice so potential adventure right you know and you could just go back to your inn at the end of the at the end of the fight <laughs> did you were you going to bring up the Gala to Seth is that what the one that you yeah were? I love the Gala gotcha. Fran read the Gala to Seth and she was like that is insane it's ridiculous not the most insane monster in Fenrir but probably the second most the, it's, it's this colossal or gargantuan like a gargantuan squid but it's a squid that can travel through ice so so there are a lot of, of well not a lot, there's a good handful of water monsters that clearly are like in the in the Stiffen Sea shore around the continent um, but this is one that actually can leave the water and go into the continent through icy things right. and it's truly terrifying Yeah. like, like, like really there's um, there's mountains, so you could be in the mountains and be okay. But yeah. a lot of the open land is glacier. Yeah, so this <laughs> it's glacier It's swimming squid. along through, yeah, yeah. And it's enormous. <laughs> it's like, terrifying. yeah, there's even, yeah. see the, the shark? See the little bitty shark right there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's a mansion, so what do you want? Um, yeah, it's not that. But, but, or is it in the new art? Ice cracker. 
Uh, the, the old art, yeah. The um, old art has the, has the little shark in the corner. He's yeah, so cute. But, but my favorite is is actually the only one I tweaked. <laughs> um, we, oh, we oh we used a lot of the uh, we used the old art in the new book. Oh, it's okay. true. Yeah. It's good to know. Yeah. Um, it, my favorite is the one I tweaked a little bit, which is the crawling glacier. It is just so phenomenally awesome. I was like, its challenge rating is twenty three. Right. So, but yet a low level party can deal with it. Mostly by running away. Yeah, because it, <laughs> because it has a move of a five. <laughs> crawling glacier, right. <laughs> so you just keep running, and eventually it might, you know, just don't run directly away from it. So you run at a curve. Yeah, don't be like and the person who's, like, straight. running in the in the horror movie where they just run straight away from the car that's behind that's them, and right. there's, like, row, you know, like, they're running down yeah. the road. They could just jump off to the side. Don't be that person. Don't be uh, that person. Just run to the side. <laughs> Run at an angle right, and hope that it continues right. to go straight, doesn't follow you, and hopefully goes for some other bait and you won't get crushed underneath a colossal. It was colossal in the old book. It has to be gargantuan now because 5e, but it's right. basic. Gargantuan doesn't necessarily have a max size, does it? Right. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's still colossal in my book of this ridiculously huge ooze. Ooze, yep. So cool. It's ice ooze, kind of like the the ice wardens in a way. I, I feel like there is a connection there. Um, and... One thing, the thing I tweaked at the very end, because I, because I'm a crazy rules, like, I, I run D&D a lot at, con or I used before COVID, I used to run D&D a lot at conventions and teach new players how to play. And so I had to learn the 5e rules pretty well. I'm not perfect at them, but well enough. So I, I spent a lot of time really delving into the, the rules. And I was like, what would it take to kill one of these things? Because they're vulnerable to fire. And, um as they were originally originally written they're terrifying as we wrote, wrote them here because of the conversion um they were suddenly kind of strangely easy to kill because they're so vulnerable to fire and because they're so slow you could just continue to pummel them with fire magic as right. you're running away so i was like we are giving them regenerate because that's dumb <laughs> so <laughs> Like, I think it was me. They might have had it, but I think I, I, I made it a tougher, like a bigger, I, I beefed it up a little bit. So, um, cause they had cold healing, but it was like kind of nerfed. So I was like, let's, let's, let's bump that up a bit. Um, so they get 20 hit points of back around <laughs> instead of like five. <laughs> cause I was right. like, I, you know, a pretty low level party can do more than five points of flame damage in a round. So it would take an hour to kill one <laughs> but you could do it um so i was like make it 20 and so now you need you need fireballs and you need a seriously high level wizards to take this thing down um because it's got a billion hit points and all of that so and plus it has the whole like i can regenerate as long as it's cold out <laughs> which it's always cold out <laughs> it's always cold out so uh, so we we didn't we didn't we went from like oh it would take like this many you know wizards on horseback to all right now we need multiple walls of fire to surround it <laughs> um, and so you could do it with like five like eighth level wizards but or so you know multiple people with walls of fire and doing right. enough fire damage you could conceivably heat up the environment to kill one but oh my god it would be like very deliberate and very difficult, um, and not something that you could do with just your regular D and D adventure right. party with one wizard and a horse. Um, so, so we 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 uh, it's it's and it's terrifying. Just like uh, the idea that you know, independent of rules, but the idea that this ginormous ooze just slowly crawls forward and you see it coming, get onto your village, right. and there's shit you can do. Like, I mean, but like, at the at the speed it moves, you could just pick the village up, move out of the way, and everything would be. <laughs> that's still like a, that's still a little over a mile. I did the math, and it's still a little over a mile an hour. Whew. So, it's it's monks not... beware. I mean, yeah, yeah. But 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 to evacuate a village, right? You know, you don't have you have hours, not days. You know, is my point. You, you, it's I feel like I feel like the people fast. the people could definitely leave in in time, but your yeah, village yeah. is probably toast. But you're you're not gonna pick up your house, is my point. Unless you have tents or something, and you're in Fenrir, like I don't That's think true. you have tents. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
So so you can evacuate your people, sure, but you're gonna lose your 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 village and your crops or yeah you know, crops or village, which or whatever you know it's is. actually a bigger danger than it may sound like because you are yeah. in a frozen wasteland and so not only yeah. do you have to then worry about freezing unless you're an eshik or an ice warden uh a taslin yeah. um or you could vary i mean where are you gonna get more trees to build your house i mean it's not i, I feel like it's not verdant enough it doesn't have just like unlimited timber to go building your house and so you don't want it especially Kova Kimmer does not want the crawling glacier to come running it over this would annihilate one of these would annihilate Kova Kimmer like like you and but if you're smart you can figure out how to turn it like I don't mean turn it like turn undead but just right. make it go in another direction yeah. like bait it and go yeah. this way which, giant glacier this way which might go that way. might be this what way. uh they originally intended the <laughs> fell deer for because <laughs> the fell deer are these enormous beasts and i feel like they're super cute they're a little grumpy but they're they're huge and so maybe it's like the gabberlin are like one. hey let's go get these fell deer and taunt the the crawling glacier this Felder way <laughs> almost as big well felder are almost as big as a crawling glacier it's yeah, like the one thing that enormous. could stand up to these other than the you know the lack of challenge rating and CR and not ability to do fire damage, but I mean, I think in a fight the Crawling Glacier would win, but in terms of mass, where do you want to have that wizard who's throwing the fireballs? On the back of a Feldir. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the question came oh. up of uh, is that why there uh, essentially like the lack of, of resources and stuff that there aren't um, many people or many settlements in Fenrir Lake? And I feel like that is definitely a part, but also it's a giant oh, frozen wasteland and not a lot of people want to live there. And so, and, and we, we marked about a good large chunk of the population are supposed to be nomads as well. Right. So they don't have permanent settlements. So, and only the permanent settlements are marked on the map. So, so there's certainly an implication that I think the exact numbers are going back up to the, to the book. And I feel like um, a lot of the permanent settlements are like humans, dwarves, Slytherin, maybe like the the yeah. like Eshik are more nomadic. They they do have like some settlements, um, and they helped to build Kova Kimru because they are able to sculpt ice, or they've learned to sculpt ice into a. Yeah. Did you call it ice works? Is that what we settled on? Yeah, we, as we, the book? I, I came up with ice works. Yeah, because um, it was like, I was like we need a name for this super magical uh, hardened ice from the original, which was so, cool. so weird. Kova Kimru, I was so so overjoyed. When I was given Kovo Kimura right. I, I I wrote chapters one and three, or I wrote chapter one. I was in the middle of writing chapter three, and I was handed Kovo Kimura as sort of a bonus. And it was I have more fun with chapter two than any part. Nice. Of the book. I loved it so. It was so fun to write. Um, and it's the only city in Fenrilic. I, I wrote all of the little blurbs for all the villages, which in in the original book he was like, you have a name. Right. <laughs> Like yeah. I had a map. Look, the, and I had there's a spot like, in the map with a name on it. What is that? With a name. So, so it was like, okay, this one's near a mountain, so I'm gonna make them miners, and this one's on the coast, so I'm gonna make it a fishing village, and this one's near some trees, so they do something with lumber, and this one's in the middle of fucking nowhere, and so it's gonna be Eshik. Yeah, yeah, because who's gonna live out there, right? <laughs> and then, and then, like one of them uh, had a name that was a really long-looking name that felt like a portmanteau, so I was like, that's a Eshik village and a human village that merged. For reasons, right. and and I'm gonna throw in some halflings for shits and giggles, um, but then it was all like keep the populations low, because I was like twenty thousand people, no five thousand people, because we had an established population for Kovo Kimru, which was eight thousand. So suddenly everything was that was supposed to be the highest population anywhere. So everything was adjusted to that. So I was like, we've got these villages with two hundred people, you know, and so the population of Fenrir like is like. 20,000 people yeah it's 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 really low and that's including like the mysterious number of of nomads who which which we didn't put a number on but we're like and there's some number of nomads <laughs> and what if <laughs> um but like but I, I did say likely in the low thousands so we're looking at really and this is humans eshik dwarves orcs slytherin halflings i think that's all the races uh, 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 Krampak, um, actually we don't have any Krampak, to be fair. Uh, 
Yeah, and, and, I mean, um, and they're all underground, so like, yeah, a lot of the so stuff it doesn't you get count. Become. It doesn't count Scarai. It doesn't count Scarai prisoners that they may have bred for purposes of creepy scariness. Right. And it doesn't count the Krampak. Right. But still, you know, so there could be an equal, large enough equivalent population underground that was not specified, but still. I don't know, I'm looking at voting numbers right now, and this feels so tiny to me. Uh, <laughs> fit the entire city of Atlanta in Fenrilic. Uh Easily. <laughs> like, or Fenrilic, uh, sorry, backward. Fit the, the entire population of Fenrilic. You know what I meant to right, say. Right, right. Um, <laughs> Hi, it's been a week. Right. <laughs> we've, had, we've had like two months in the last four days. <laughs> Let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, um, there's so much more. Um... Uh, oh, I, so Cobra Cameroon, I, as I said, um, uh, we, we were talking a little bit about religion. There's a bunch of, there's just some cool stuff in there. Um, as I said, the map, if you want the map that goes with the city description, it will be coming in Yeti's journal when I get nice. that out in the next couple weeks. Um, but there's, I wrote like 20 NPCs. Um, and then the, I, I didn't write the, there's three inns. There's an inn and a flop house and a, uh, bar, tavern. I didn't write those descriptions. Um, that was a that was uh, a trip. And Trick and Fran wrote those. Um, but there's more NPCs in there. But so there's a good whole bunch of people that you can play with, um, who have all of all of those different races I just named. Plus, um, although I didn't make any Taslin NPCs, so there's room for that because they're so new and they're so rare. Um, I didn't, but they could be showing up in a later volume. Um, as we're thinking about doing some more stuff after I finish Yanni's journal, we've got some more potential Fenrir -like books in the work. Books in the works in the works. Nice. Great. Well, you're you're involved, buddy. It's true. It's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you have to write some Taslin. That is also true. <laughs> um trying to think of uh a good segue for this but it's going to be hey speaking of characters so the frostlands book also has some uh new player character stuff which i think is amazing because it it opens up the book for players as well as dms yeah because we've got ice walkers which was the obvious one because yeah. that was in the original book and they can do cool things like they can grab ice and make anything that doesn't have a moving part in like a round so nice. anything tiny so it's like i have a nice dagger or i have a nice magnifying glass i don't know <laughs> a plate <laughs> well that's how you that's how you take out the crawling glacier you get your ice magnifying glass and you just glass. hold it just well it can right. only be so big though so. laser <laughs> i don't know I'm trying to think of small things <laughs> tiny things ice pen i don't know just pen of moving parts but uh, yeah, so you can make little little things out of ice and like round, and they can make an uh, like an igloo kind of thing in like ten round in like ten minutes. Um, they can make an ice shelter that's like com relatively comfortable. So cool stuff. Yeah. There. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, my NPC Pitsu, who shows up in the book and who will be showing up in Yanni's journal, is an ice walker because that shouldn't be a surprise. Right. Uh, but then we have some other stuff too. Yeah. That I had nothing to do with, so I'm pointing at you because I can't describe it. I also didn't have anything to do with, so I'm looking at them now. So oh, you also didn't have yeah. anything to do with Okay. So they, okay, they introduced a new uh, Bard College, the College of Hope, which yeah. I think is really interesting considering the landscape. Um, maybe not the most hopeful place, but yeah, in it even says in a land with very little light and warmth. Uh, it's the bards in the College of Hope that bring comfort to the people of Fenrir Lake. And I really like that idea that from this wasteland, hope springs forth and keeps these people going. Um, so they... Uh, hope springs in turtles. In turtles, that's right. Ice turtles. <laughs> that is a meme, folks. <laughs> this is an old meme. Okay. But they but so yeah, they use their bardic hope, inspiration yeah. to give them temporary hit points, which I think is a super cool um, twist on yeah. on the inspiration. So you're you're giving someone the extra boost of um, will to go on rather than the ability to be like, oh, I can really focus on hitting this thing or doing this skill check or whatever. 
Um, and and Song of Warmth, when your party member drops and you're really desperate and you need the bard to fix you. Right, <laughs> right. Because clerics aren't really a thing in Fenrilic. Yeah. So no clerics, no paladins, again. You really need druids and bards. Druids and bards and um, rangers. Rangers can heal. Yeah. I think there's a lot of rangers, honestly. Yeah, I feel like rangers are, are good... Like they they have a bulk of of the uh, the population, but having played many rangers, we suck as healers. Don't rely on the I ranger. Think rangers kind of suck in general. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and then they introduce. Hunter's mark. I'm done. <laughs> right. Um, then there's the monk. Yeah. The, the way of the yeah. winter soul. Um. So again, a monk that's resistant to cold. Um, and, and another thing we did um, because of the Ashik and the uh, Tazlin is resistance to heat. <laughs> because even though it's not warm um, in most places in Fenrilic beyond the... And the, the only reason Kobu Kimura is as livable as it is because they have this volcanic hot springs that actually make it tolerable. Um, Ashik and, and Tazlin and ice, war, ice, ice Wardens are vulnerable to heat. They take damage. When it's, it's true room temperature i mean it's what happens humans. when you're made of ice but yeah, it sucks as melt, a player character frosty the flipping snowman <laughs> so we have all these things so that eshik won't melt because yeah. <laughs> not a lot of the others but there's eshik is um probably a tied for highest population in fenrir like in terms right. of, of, of of racial species there's as many eshik as humans and everything else there's less um so they're gonna be around humans Sure. Um, and they're going to be in warm places. And so there's a lot of magic to keep Eshik from melting. <laughs> truth, truth. <laughs> um, and they won't melt in like, you know, 40, 50 degrees. But right. when it, you get to the hot spring where it's going to be 70s, 80s, 90s Fahrenheit, they're not going to be very comfortable. Um, and and so we've, we've also got a bunch of things, that, including a ring of frost, frost, which keep which which protects you from heat which like why would you need a ring that protects you from heat in fenrilic right because it seems stupid right because like think you'd want this in 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 the accruden desert right <laughs> asherak you know well and, and eshik would definitely want it when they if they eshik ever travel does. to the the accruden they go anywhere like you go you go into and to Kobu Kimuru, like the way i thought of it is is so we've got all these eshik leaders in Kobu Kimuru and then in the in the the, the the council and everything and the, and their their elected head is an eshik and um I, I was like she totally has one of these rings because the humans tend to have meetings in like um the the sauna lodges because it's nice and comfy and they're like so she's like i can i must I, and i'm picturing arva solara from arva, arva solara from the expanse I, I totally picture that with this character not not so much with the swearing but definitely with the attitude um, and then she's like, stop having meetings without me. Right. And she's got the ring of heat protection on. And she's like, I will be in this sauna. And I will, I will not let the Slytherin and the humans and the orcs and the dwarves talk without me. Right. Um, I feel like, uh, so I, I think as Fran mentioned earlier that the culture that is, that, you know, comes out of uh, Fenrilic is really unique and, and fun. And I feel like this is like one of those cross-culture things where you have these Eshik that are like, you know, being taken into saunas and they're like, you know, evaporating water and they might have like pools that people sit in and you, the Eshik are just like wait you do what why <laughs> what i even i even added a, an Eshik council member. so Eshik don't need clothes because they don't they don't get cold yeah yeah so they basically wear clothing for armor pockets decorative yeah or or i was thinking probably shoes Snowman likes to be barefoot. Yeah, I mean, uncomfortable. I, I think a lot of it is also like to make humans feel comfortable because humans are. But like... it's really yeah. So culturally, <laughs> it's to make humans feel comfortable, right. so you don't have your your stuff hanging out. So I added this one council member who's like, no. So he just walks into council meeting wearing nothing but shoes. <laughs> I'm wearing clothes. See. <laughs> no, no, no. He does, he's just wears shoes because he doesn't want to walk around barefoot because somebody might have peed or something. So he, he like, I'm not stepping in, Especially in, in the song. felder poop. Right? So he has shoes, but that's all he has. <laughs> nice. So, anyway, like, so I created, I created. 
Uh oh. Uh oh. She's gone. I'll let her continue that when she comes back. Um, but yeah, so then there's also the, uh, there's a new sorcerer's origin that you shot and marked, which I think is interesting. Um, the little unit as we were doesn't crash on me. About, hey, oh, we were talking about the, the shot and marked and how, uh, you know, again, they have, uh, this connection to Termana, but not to the Elspad. So, uh, the shot and marked have these like primal surges that, Oh, you're talking about the sorcerer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot because I, I, we, um, and it's totally off topic here, but uh, onto new topic, I should say. Um, because these shadow were introduced in the Termana book, and we, but not much is, was done with them. It was like, okay, there's these spirits, and the Titans were probably powerful Ushada, and that's about it. And what does it mean? And we've got, we've got sorcerers with god origins we've got sorcerers with titan origins yeah there should be a new shot at origin yeah Come on. so i think it's i think it's great um because honestly when you think about it there if there has to be more than 13 uber ushada you know i think there's tons of ushada who have titan potential they just don't have a moon to eat <laughs> nom, 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 nom. Nom, nom, nom. so it's like we should have gone up there with the rest of them right? you know um and so so I, I mean, I imagine that there. I mean, imagine there's some Ushada who's like, I'm the Ushada of this flower. You know, I live for a month. But then there's some that are like, I'm the Ushada of this volcano, or I'm right. the Ushada of this coral reef, or I'm the Ushada of this glacier. Yeah. <laughs> and and even though there aren't, like, typical paladins, on Fenrilic, you could say that. Uh, the path of the ancients is a great way to recognize or to like um, reflect Ushada instead of uh, divine origin. So you can have a paladin that's like, I'm a path of the ancient worshiping essentially Ushada that are, yeah, so you get the yeah. same abilities, but this, I like this sorcerer's origin that essentially kind of has this wild magic flavor to it where you're trying to control nature, but nature is really hard to control. And so you get these primal surges. So if you, uh, when you roll yeah. a one, kind of like primal or uh, wild magic, kind of like you roll wild one, yeah. uh, you, you have this primal surge that happens and it's, it's some, you know, like various effects. And if I were a DM that had somebody like this in the party, I would probably build on this rather than just use the six, but the six is a great start where you have like, uh, you know, wind picks up around you and everyone has to make a strength save or fire erupts out of the ground, which would be terrifying if you were, like, an Eshik. <laughs> and you're just like, why am I making fire? <laughs> the Eshik adventurer has one of them frost rings, I gotta tell you. <laughs> <laughs> right? But it, it just stops them from taking, like, uh, damage or, like, from melting in the heat. It doesn't stop them from, like, getting hit by oh, well, fireballs yeah, no, and dying. Yeah, no, it won't stop them from taking fire damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll just stop them from melting in the heat, but... Yeah, but fire damage hurts everybody. It's not like it's right. really unique to them. Right. Um, but they take more fire damage. Um, I take it from me having Irana, my and my big goober Skylands 15 year campaign. They go to Fenrilic as part of that, and they ended up um, uh, as part of the giant plot. They were rescuing Semeshik from some Skarai, because that's what you do long before any of this stuff. This was three five. Um, D and D, and they, uh, the uh, wizard in the party, or cleric, or whatever, the spellcaster in the party, um, threw a fireball. <laughs> ah! <laughs> killed a bunch of Eshik. Right. Uh, killed a bunch of Skarai, but also killed a bunch of Eshik that they were trying to rescue. So, that sucked. And she felt she still feels. I think she still feels guilty to this day. The player. As like, she should. I was like years ago um <laughs> at least five years ago that i ran that um but uh yeah it's like oops didn't mean it it's like they're vulnerable to fire they're right take double damage or whatever the three five vulnerable to fire did at time and a half or something i don't know but they took extra damage and um i had i originally it was just like they were just from the book and i was like okay i'm gonna give some of them class levels so they have a chance of not dying yeah right <laughs> Right. I think it was one guy. It's like this one guy who was like their leader. I was like, okay, he's level 
Nine. <laughs> and he made his save. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> he didn't die horribly. But yeah, it was like, and is there any rogue? Maybe maybe one of them is rogue and made their save and evaded Got their out way. Got away, right? But it was like... Flung up like their ice cape, which melted, died. but kept them safe. Yeah, I know. It's like, no. Poor guys. So, so yeah, fire bad. <laughs> yeah, fire bad. Fire bad. Um, you know, there's some, some new equipment, some new magic items in there. Not a whole bunch, uh, but there are new spells in the uh, Frostlands of Fenrir book, which... Well, um, it's mostly conversions. Yeah, yeah, mostly world. conversions. And I, I th yeah, I'm, I've been really happy because most of the people that have been reviewing the book or saying their their favorite spell from it is Empathy of the Faceless One is it's also my favorite spell um, because it's... Um, so... It's Thanks. based on Gulthane, who was the Titan that got ripped apart by his own, or like got blinded by his own, you siblings. know, brethren. His siblings yeah. were like, you're so nice, let's blind you and tear and your face off. Yeah, it's really horrible. And so like there's blind, this... Deaf and blind, everything. Right. And so there's a um, spell that causes a person that does damage to somebody the same damage in return. So you still do damage if you're if you're attacking but it comes back to you um i think it was such a neat spell and seeing it show up in in this version i was i was pretty stoked and the fact that other people are stoked about it i was just like yay what oh else yeah is there? i introduced i also introduced a couple of spells in yenny's journal nice comes out um I, I, two i bring back from three five days that i'm like why haven't these been converted yet um, but I introduced a new spell because I wanted to, which had nothing to do with Venice. <laughs> Called Create Coffee. Nice. So you can, you can see that little wonder. Because, <laughs> damn it, I right. wanted it. So I can talk about Create Coffee at some other session, but I needed to. I, is, I, it's something I wrote. Is Quicksober I showing up? Quicksober is coming back. I, 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 have, I wrote Quicksober. Um, because damn it, I've been complaining about the fact that Quicksilver hasn't been converted yet. I want right. it in. I want it in any book. Um, I think it's a great cantrip. Um, I I nerfed it a whole bunch, so nobody can complain that it's OP. So I added Quicksilver, um, and I added Endure Elements, which I nerfed a bunch because Mike Merrill's can bite me. Um, <laughs> so I really found it. Why didn't they convert Endure Elements? Because. It's too overpowering, and it doesn't make the terrain environment as deadly. And I'm like, going to Fenrir, like, then under elements, you walk outside and you will die. <laughs> like, it's always below zero. Right. I don't care how much clothing you're wearing. If it's winter time, unless there's no sun, it is 40 below, 24-7, you will die. If you're not an Eshik or, or, or have some kind of magic, you will die. So, endure elements, please. Right. <laughs> Can we have it back? So I, I mega nerfed it. I was like, it's like one person, eight hours. To 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 protect a party of four, you're gonna have to blow like a ton of your spells. Um, so it's still not it, low level party is still fucked. Yeah. <laughs> a little party's like, we can only be outside for a little while before we have to go back in here. But um but at least a higher level party is like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> As it kinda should be. I mean, you've yeah, spent yeah. a lot of time getting there. You should be able to yeah. go outside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So so your 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 twelfth level wizard is like, okay, I'm gonna spend like three fourth level spells to yeah. protect everybody instead of of because uh, it's like one person per spell level for eight hours. So did math. Um but yeah, so instead of or uh, more first level spells than they can have <laughs> to protect a low level party. So it's still there. It's still a, a challenge. But I, so I brought back into elements and and create coffee, which and create coffee. Okay, I'm I'm gonna talk about it. I'm sorry, I love this spell too much. Um, so it 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 removes a level of fatigue. Um, but then if you drink more than one cup of coffee, or one or one serving of coffee, bad things can happen, because of caffeine. Like you can't get the benefit of a long rest if you drink too much. <laughs> um, and also you can dump coffee on people's heads and do damage. 
<laughs> nice. <laughs> so it's like nice. The idea of like of scalding coffee. Let's like create water. You know how you create water? Like I create water and do like a bunch of it and put out a fire or whatever. You can create a bunch of coffee and put out and set. So it's basically that that poor woman who got burned at McDonald's with the, you know, the not trivial lawsuit because it was for reals. Um. So like think really hot coffee and just and so yen i gave it to yenny because she would have it <laughs> that's fair <laughs> even though she but so it's not not a fenrilic spell per se but I, I threw that i'm throwing that in um and, and i'm not done with uh, yenny's journal yet so there may be some more shit like that but those three spells show up in addition to all of our wonderful spells in the book that's already out including a bunch of cold spells because cold damage is a gimme um, and interestingly um some things like the uh like the the Tazlin, one of the things you did was if they cast a spell that would do fire damage it does cold damage. yeah so a Tazlin wizard does cold, cold balls balls. wait <laughs> 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 and cold bolt and wall and of cold bolt <laughs> wall of cold wall of yep. cold yep it tracks <laughs> <laughs> I love it I absolutely love it. and they're like I am I'm throwing cold bolt at an Eshik it does nothing <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, but they can't literally can't cast fireball which I mean because you give them so many powers you gotta nerf them in some way it's true so, yeah um so so there's there's that so there's a whole bunch of frosty spells um that i think are fun um, nice yeah one thing gets me is that we have to do that table um like that we've got this table it's like bard spells blah cleric spells blah oh yeah, yeah. True. And, it, and it like repeat so like yeah. in in three five days it would be the spell name and then paren and then the, the the casters who can cast it yeah and now it's like you have to have this table and so you can't say in the spell description oh this because we have to make everything look the same <laughs> so it's got this so you look at cold snap and it's like who can cast it everyone and they have to go back to the table <laughs> and <find it>. cast it. <laughs> uh so nice. that's that's yeah because i'm having to build that table for three spells <laughs> it's true any other yeah. lore stuff you can think of i'm always thinking of yeah, I'm talking about you know uh, talking about having to build a book. How we when you publish something for the vault, and this this is important. Um, is is like that is having it match the the standards and the formatting that are out there. Um, there's two guides. Wizards of the Coast has a fifth edition how to write for fifth edition guide, but um, uh, uh, Onyx Path has a how to write for Scarlands guide as well, um, and they're they, they, they work together um it should read them both before you write anything for the vault <laughs> i mean you can probably get away with publishing stuff without obeying those guides but your your piece will be better as a result and um as and as frustrating as some of the languages because you're like i want to keep my word count low but i have to describe this thing really detailed because that's the standard for spell descriptions do it anyway because um, because of that consistency so players it's less confusing for players if it's if it's always written the same way and, and using those standards of instead of saying you know it's a dc 20 you know uh, what is it I, I wrote about it in my blog post but it's like 20 DC, reflex save dc 20 no it's it's a dc 20 reflex save and i know that sounds like does it matter it does because when you're doing it a lot, it can get confusing. Um, and and there's that consistency, especially for the GMs. And, and little things like what gets bolded, what gets italicized, um, what what has things like parent, like periods and colons and all of that, it's very consistent. So it's quicker for the GM to find the information. And providing a table of contents. Also, GMs love those things. Yeah. <laughs> Please. not like um, the creature collection <laughs> which was beautiful except for they didn't put it in the table contents which is what is what's that i i i i addressed that bug three times three different ways when we were 
reviewing that as part of the Kickstarter as you know as a fan. Yeah. Like I put it on. I put. I put it in their comment thing, which they fixed some of my other comments. Like I was like, oh, this thing is. They fixed it. I put it in the, uh, the the, fan community thing. I, I, I think I might have even emailed it, to the guy writing the book. <laughs> I don't remember if I emailed it or not. I might have. <laughs> not bitter. <laughs> okay. Uh love the art in Frostlands of Fenrilic. I had nothing to do with it. Um, cuz I'm not an artist except for the map of except for the uh the village maps. I I are the um the uh, Fran made the um the three end maps um based on sketchworks by others, but she did the art for the three uh three Ends, which I love. I think they're great. Nice. Um, they're simple, but we didn't. She did it in like two days. Nice. So. Who knows? I mean, she, she. It was so funny because early in the process, it was all me. Cause she, I did all the writing, and she was like end of the end of it because she was doing the editing mostly. She and she did a little bit of writing, but not nearly as much as as you or me or I did. Um, so she was she was kind of left in the end, and then and then the last. Three days, she crunched like a maniac getting these in maps done, and I was like, "She's gonna remember to eat, dear." <laughs> I, I I helped a little bit, but you know, um, but I I love the way uh, they came out, and I think it's I think it's pretty fun. Nice, yeah. And the art so. that's on the screen right now is from the adventure, um, which I think oh, is called M Two Tobor Gorge. Uh, that one, Travis did that art actually yeah yeah i'm just saying the the art in the book that is on the screen right now is from the adventure called into tobor gorge Gorge. and essentially this is the adventures looking down into this super deep chasm um which they have developed a lift for and so the lift which is this jinky elevator that lowers them down into it and they're like the first to really kind of go down into the bottom of the all gorge. the way to the bottom yeah. yeah so it's that's the idea it's a it's a fun adventure it was just recently played on onyx paths twitch. twitch which i've been waiting for the uh the youtube to come out so i could share it i haven't seen it yet yeah. but once that does uh keep an eye out for it because it was a fun game so it was an interesting game because a lot of us were in the chat during nice. the uh, during nice. the game and um and we're like, and and I and it was funny because uh, Ailey ran a reduced version of it, so she took out like all the intro plot, like why are you going and all that stuff. There's there's like a whole chapter that she completely stripped out, um, because of time. Cause yeah. She wanted, she needed to run it in like two hours or something. Right. And when I, I I ran the play test of it before we launched, well before we launched, we we're still writing on it back in July, uh, or August or whenever. Um, and it was like two sessions, so it's, it was it was pretty beefy. Uh, it, was, it was a good. I'm gonna say a good eight hour. Yeah. If you if you cover everything, if you do all the NPCs and have them wander about and, and stuff, it's a good eight eight to ten hour game. Yeah. Um, and with which is amazing because you're not only combat, because <laughs> combat's usually a thing that takes forever. Um, and so she she ran a condensed version, but um, the plot of it, part of the plot involves Yenny and Loazi, my 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 wizard characters, and she didn't include them. It did not go very well for the party. <laughs> I feel like uh, there might have game, been info they needed to give or something. Um, well, no, it wasn't the info so much as their presence. <laughs> like having them there yeah. may have may have shifted the battle at the end more in the party's favor. So if you don't use Yenny in the final fight, you might want fewer bad guys to avoid a TPK, <laughs> which. Was or Blake. you know you're just allowing Skurai to or you're increase allowing Skurai their to numbers. Destroy the Cranback Village and it's <laughs> uh, yeah yeah. So either reduce the number of bad guys or have the Cranback involved in the fight or or have Yenny involved in the fight. Um, like the module says Yenny should be involved in the fight. Um, I've I've now written up Yenny and she's like almost too powerful and she shifted the tide too far. So if you're going to use Yenny from from Yenny's journal. Add more monsters. <laughs> so for she, she can be fighting them in a corner while everybody else is fighting the smaller guys. Um, but I guess, holy shit, because uh, I had to make her a minimum level because of what she should be able to do. Um, it's a pain. I keep five e rules. Uh, so yeah. Um, 
there was all of that. So yeah. it's fun though. It was fun. And and I ran so I was saying I ran it, Ailey ran it, and I think their Travis is gonna be running it this weekend. I believe so. I believe Yeah, for Game World um, Con. For Game World Con at least twice, I believe. Nice. Um, so and I, th I believe he's running the condensed version again because it's so long. Right. Um, and then you're are you I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> uh, Jeremy's Frostlands adventure maybe doing? Uh, I mean, Chaz, Chaz and I are, are wrapping up the end of... Uh, it's Ideally, it will be a, a adventure you can run for a solo, so one DM and one player, um, with the oh, also oh. ability to play it for a, a group. Um, it was going to come out on release day of Frostlands of Fenderlick, but we decided to hold off, and we will probably be putting out next week. We actually need to wrap, wrap up a couple of things on it. Um, but because there are already so many amazing things on many the amazing. Solution Vault for Fenderlick, I just posted the link. Go over to the Solution Vault. Check those out. There's yeah, already... Like um, there's New like monsters. seven, eight additional titles. Yeah. All came out day one or like either day one or very, very early the next day. Um, people just, I mean, they, they, I think people have been working on it, having either just read the, because we put out two teasers. Right. They're either basing it on what we, what little we provided in the teasers or just their own ideas. Yeah. Um, or, and, or for what was in um, Strange or Strange Lands and just put out stuff super fast. Yeah. Okay, there's some monsters. There's some uh, player races. Things. Yeah. I think the uh, the to Tozer can, the Tozer can, the Tozer con, yeah, the, the, elephant the, people? the elephant people. They're so fun. Like, yeah, yeah. and the uh, yeah. the frost apes. I think is another one that's a player player, player race. I'm intrigued by. Uh, I was intrigued, very intrigued by one of them in particular. The um, uh, there's some more playable uh, uh, race stuff about. I think it was Ushada based stuff. I mean, nice. Some more. Some more um, is that the voices of the options. snow? Yeah, I think that was it. That was yeah. the um, there's some so, NPCs on there. There's some new monsters. Yep. I mean, yeah, already there's so. stuff showing up, already which is fun. great. And both Jeremy and I play more. So as I said, oh, and 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 and, and, and Mary, uh, on the fifteenth, I will be running um, a game on Onyx Path Switch Channel nice. at n noon Pacific, so three p.m. Eastern. Yep. Um, I should be. I'll be running a one shot. Um, high level game because gosh darn it um, where people are going to be playing some of those NPCs from Frostland nice. um, that I might release in a later volume um, if, if, if it all goes well um, so they're going to be playing some of those those uh, city council members dealing with some some shit happening in Purple yeah, Cameroon that's fine. Um, so so having just a little 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 mini adventure was like you know like it's just going to be a four-hour council meeting honestly don't 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 watch it's gonna be really boring they're gonna have an election and the results are gonna be really right. close they're gonna actually and, count and, them in real time yeah 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 and and, and yeah. it's gonna be four days of them counting ballots or longer because <laughs> <laughs> no. they, they were sent by penguin <laughs> yeah yeah it was a penguin running for kovu Kimmer city council um <laughs> so. right. But yeah, but but that is true. Like I do want them to play like like the the, the movers and shakers of Cover Camera nice, and nice. give them maybe a little bit more character and um and I don't know if anyone's gonna play the the council member who runs around in nothing but shoes, but maybe maybe somebody will play him. I don't right. know yet. Someone has to. <laughs> I feel like someone has to. I really do. Um, uh, and and um also just totally random. At the time that I was writing these NPCs. You know, take a guess of what I was absorbing at the time. I was playing Dragon Age 3 and binging Deep Space Nine. Nice. And I can't say there wasn't a little bit of influence <laughs> of those two. If you look closely at some of these NPC strips. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, there are worse things to be influenced by, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Deep Space Nine. I don't know. Just, just roll with it. So if you want to play around with that, um, figure out who's who. Right. It was just a little teeny. I mean, not saying that they mapped any actual characters. It was mostly just like some vague. Yeah, most of these characters have a paragraph, so. Um, nice. But yeah. 
Well, I think that pretty much wraps up today's episode chatting about Fenrilic. I hope to see a lot more stuff on the Solution Vault that we can come back to Fenrilic and chat about. Um, new lore, new races, new monsters, and we can build oh, on I, the history. Oh, I one thing, uh, it was early in the book. Um, I also included, we also included rules for, and Travis was like, do this stuff. Uh, weather, dealing yeah. with the weather, yeah. dealing with hazards, and dealing with trying to climb into Kobu Kimru or fly into Kobu Kimru. There's rules on all of those things. Nice. So if you're looking for like, and they're they're you know based on rules from 50, but modified like stole from 35. Um, so if you're looking for like, in, if you're like, oh, Prime of the Frost Maiden has shit environment hazard rules. Pick this up and grab these. This will can leverage them. Yeah. Did you mean uh, the gorge, not the not the city? So Tobor, Tobor Gorge. Yeah. Oh, did I say Tobor? Did I say Tobor Gorge? Yeah, you to did. To getting in and out of Tobor Gorge. But Fran um, caught it for us. <laughs> what did I say? I don't know you what said Tobor Gorge. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, so like climbing yeah, into sorry, icy sorry. gorges. Tobor Gorge. Yeah. It's chapter three. I, I wrote that a billion years ago. I don't remember anymore. But yeah, chapter three. Uh, getting in and out of Tobor Gorge and climbing, flying, and taking the lift nice i nice. made hazards for taking the lift yeah <laughs> oh my god oh more nightmare stories about how we wrote how i wrote the lift and fran and i arguing about the physics and finally going a wizard did it <laughs> magic <laughs> <laughs> how would you really do it you'd have like a tensor's floating disc i don't know right absolutely <laughs> All right. Do you wanna do you wanna do your outro? Tell us all about yeah, yourself. Yeah, sure, sure. Sarah Stewart, author of this thing. Woo-hoo. Um, but but today, author of one of the big authors of Frostlands of Fenrilic. Um, and I uh, wrote the first three chapters. So. Um, or most of the first three, not all of the first three, chapters, most of the first three chapters. Um, and coming out with Annie's journal, hopefully by the fifteenth when I run that game on the fifteenth. So, and then I'm also, uh, I do a bunch of other things, but yeah. Find me on Drive Through RPG. I've got like four other titles up there. Um, but other than Vigilant, none of them were successful as Frostlands have been. <laughs> so, if you like say, chapter it's one been, through three of Frostlands, the opening of Frostlands has definitely been like the surge to the, the Sorician Vault that it, I'm, I'm so happy to see it because everything before that, like there's a, a decent amount of stuff up there, but it's been a little slow. And Travis even like mentioned that in a recent interview, you know, like it's it's building in its um, audience. Even though Scarlands itself has a pretty decent audience, like the actual Serration Vault has been a little slow. But this new influx of lore and and opportunity, so many great new things, and I I just can't wait to see it continue. Yay! If you liked my writing in Frostlands? Go pick up one of my other books. Yeah, do that. And there will be links in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, they're down there. Go click on them. <laughs> yeah, take a stabby stab stab at it. Do it. Um, I'm Jeremy Hochalter. I also publish over on Solution Vault and Drive Through, RPG, DMs Guild, all that. You can find me at Twitter on Twitter at WH Pubs, on here on Twitch and on Facebook at WH Publications. Uh, catch me on Mondays when Sarah and I are both on Travis Legg's Scarred Lands A Family Affair campaign. Ridiculously fun campaign. And and right now we're all on the edge of death right. from fighting fire things. There's a lot of fire. So completely there's unlike today, fire. there's a lot of fire. Yeah, um, it's been a little triggering for me living fire. like right next to a major wildfire, but that's all right. <laughs> that was last summer or right? fall or... Um, he's, and he's over on Plastic Age Plays. Yep. Yeah, because that one's not. But you on... can see that on the Onyx Path channel. Does it also which... go over there? Cool. If you want to oh, chat yeah. with us, come over to Pl- Plastic Age Plays. Otherwise, it's also over there. On Wednesdays, I play uh, in Chaz Calendar's game. It's a Final Fantasy XIV inspired D and D five E 
crazy, crazy game that's here on WH Publications. And on Fridays, obviously here with Sarah uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern for Lure, you know, and at 4.30 p.m. Eastern for the Curiosity Cache, another Scarlands actual play. Yay. So, until next week, which I think we're heading back to... Gelsbad. Finally gets the promised Holofaust that we talked about we like will, a month ago. We will do the Holofaust. <laughs> do you have another but thing if, to say? Oh, just if anyone has any other questions about this. And that there's also, as I said, three, I wrote three blog posts about writing this yeah. up on the Onyx Path website, including one that describes how to make um, NPC stat blocks. Totally. Because pain in the ass. And that will be <laughs> also in the show notes. Yeah. Perfect. Check All right. Page. Until next time, everybody, stay safe, stay happy, take care of yourselves and each other. Don't be angry. Yeah. <laughs> Best to everyone. Bye. Bye.